Bill Kennedy, are the really one of the best crowds we've had at Go Miami. We have like 20 people. Wow, that is awesome. I'm gonna have to invite Steve more often. So before we start and I introduce Steve, first I want to thank SendGrid, who sponsors us. They pay for the food, they pay um, for the place, um, and they've been uh, a huge help for us. So big round of applause. SendGrid. Um, they didn't pay for the cookies. Uh, tonight we have a really special guest named Steve Francia. I was blocking. Oh, sorry. Um, Steve is the creator of a, a static web blogging framework called Yugo that we're now using at Arden Studios as well. Um, I'm going to be switching to Go and Go Blog over to Yugo. The Gopher Academy website is being switched over to Yugo. So if you're doing blogging, static blogging, it's an incredible system. Steve's 50 times faster than what? <laughs> and Jekyll. Uh, and Steve um, has a huge background in, in giving talks both in Go and MongoDB. Uh, Steve works for MongoDB. He's an advocate over there. So if you're doing anything with MongoDB as well, Steve is a, is a great resource for that. But um, Steve is also an incredible Go developer as well. So uh, I'm going to switch it over to Steve now. Steve? Hi, how are you all doing? Awesome. All right, so um, I'd like to start by doing the presentation first. I've intentionally made the presentation short, uh, which is because I want to uh, have a discussion afterwards or during. So the intent is this is kind of broad strokes, and please ask questions. I'd love to talk about, you know, really anything related to Go. Um, so, you know, feel free to ask questions or, or whatever, um, anytime. I will say, though, I can barely hear anyone in that room, so if you're going to ask questions, get closer to the mic or have Bill text them to me. No, just get close to the mic because it'll disappear quick because I'm using my phone as my video camera. Um, all right, so by show of hands of the four people I can see, and Bill, maybe you could just help out here. How many people here have used Go before? That looked like half the 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 four people I could see. Oh, there's more. All right. Um, all right. Sweet. That's very helpful. Um, all right. So I think this is. Um, I think this talk is good. It really speaks to most people come from an object-oriented background, um, and and we're going to kind of talk about how that relates to Go. Um, and so the title of this talk is Go for Object-Oriented Programmers or Object-Oriented Programming Without Objects. Um, and we're we're really going to focus more on the on the second half. Of the so I I got a great introduction uh, from from Bill. I won't go over that again. Uh, I want to start off with this quote, and I'm actually going to move this so I can see it all. Um, this is from someone on, on Hacker News he, whose name is unpronounceable, but he said, most of the appeal for me is not the features that Go has, but rather the features that have been intentionally left out. And the more and more I use Go, the more and more uh, this statement rang true with me. I really love how simple the language, simple and elegant the language design was. And, and truly, um, a feature of Go is, is the lack of features. And for a lot of languages, uh, systems, that seems like it's an oxymoron. Uh, but the more you use Go, the more that, that really makes sense. Um, Rob Pike, the, one of the creators of Go, said, why would you use why would you have a language that is not theoretically exciting? And the answer is because it's very useful. And really, that that also describes Go very well. That every every component of Go is designed to be useful. There's not very uh, much by way of deep theory. <laughs> Everything there is for is designed with a, a real purpose. So, what do objects look like in Go? 
All right. Is that any better? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the first question to ask is, does Go have objects? Uh, well, well, we know Go does not have any classes, and Go does not have anything called an object. Um, but does that mean Go has objects? So let's really look and see what is an object. Um, and, and I think a good definition of an object, a, a kind of commonly used one, is an object is an abstract data type that has state or data and behavior, so code. So it's a mix of, of data along with logic. Um, and so in Go, let's use some different examples in Go and show how, how Go accomplishes this. Uh, the first one is a, is a struct. Uh, this is a struct of a rectangle. Uh, we're calling it uh, type rect. Um, and it has two properties, a width and a height. So that, that's the data. Uh, now, how do we apply uh, logic or programming uh, to the data? How can we apply some methods to it? In Go, we're able to, um, to attach uh, methods onto, onto different data structures. In this case, we're going to attach one to our rect. Uh, this is a method called area that returns an integer. And if you notice, it takes uh, it takes it binds to rect, uh, so, and it uses r, um, and we'll just multiply width times height and, re and return it. Um, I think this one looks pretty familiar to a lot of people coming from different languages. Uh, it, it looks very much to me coming from uh, kind of a dynamic language background, uh, like a, a, an object with methods on it. Um, and then we can run it in action. So here we're going to create a new uh, variable, uh, r, and we're going to assign it uh, the value of uh, rect, which has a width of 10 and a height of 5. And then we're going to print out uh, to the console uh, the value, or the output from the method area when it's called on r. And in this case, it will give us 50. Uh, we can do we can uh, bind methods on different types so it's not just structs uh, which to me resemble objects uh, very closely but you can bind different types so in this case what we have is a slice of rex and uh, we call it rex which makes sense um, and in this case we're going to create an area method on a slice. A slice, if you're not familiar with Go, is a, a dynamic array. Um, so it's an array of variable length. Um, and in this case, we've defined an area method on that, on that slice that will sum the total of all of the areas of all of the individual rect um, structs and return us the total. And in action here, we've now we've created uh, two different recs uh, with two different you know height and weight uh, height and width uh, values, uh, and then we've put them into a rex. And remember, that's a slice of rect. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to print out each individual component here. So we'll print out the area of each individual one, and then the area of of the uh, slice. And at the bottom, these slides are online on my blog at spf13.com and uh, there's links at the bottom of most of the code slides so you can actually run them in the Go Play uh, playground yourself. Any questions so far? If there are, just stop me, but uh, please ask questions if you have them. All right, going ahead. Uh, so, for a third example, and I think this one's a really interesting example, in Go, uh, function is a native type. Um, and so what we're doing here is we have, we're defining a new type, which is of, of type function. Um, and it's a function that returns an int. So that's the function signature, and our type is called foo. Uh, we're then going to bind a method 
onto foo. So we're binding a method onto a function. The method takes uh, an int and it adds it to foo, uh, whatever the result of foo is, and then returns that. And just, so to see it in action, uh, what we have here is we're, we're declaring a variable x of type foo. We're setting the variable x to a function. In this case, it's a simple function just for illustrative purposes. It will return 1. We can then print out the value of x uh, when it's called as a function, which will give us 1. And then in the next line, what we've done here is we're printing out the value of uh, running the method on x. And in this case, we're adding 3 to 1. So, so the, fourth one, the, the last line there will give us a return of 4. So in my, by, by the definition we've used, Go does have objects. They're, they're not the name objects, and I think that's done uh, because it, it's, it's pretty different from traditional object uh, design in most languages. But it's hard to say, look at the slides we just uh, went through and say those aren't objects. They, they clearly mix data and logic together. Uh, so, so we, we know Go has objects, but is Go object oriented? Um, and that, that's the big question. Uh, from Wikipedia, it says a language is usually considered object based if it includes the basic capabilities for an object identity, properties, and attributes. Uh, a language is considered object oriented if it is object based and also has the capability of polymorphism and inheritance. So Go is object-based, but is it object-oriented? Um, so let's look at those two different terms. The first one we have here is inheritance. Uh, so kind of question, what is inheritance, or what, what's the purpose of inheritance? Inheritance was designed to provide a, a reuse of objects. Uh, in inheritance, classes are created in hierarchies, and inheritance lets the structure and methods in one class pass down the hierarchy. So they inherit from uh, the structures above them. What's Go's approach? Uh, well, Go explicitly avoided inheritance. Um, that was part of the design. The design was to avoid it. Go strictly follows the composition over inheritance principle, and Go provides composition through embedded types. Uh, so what is composition? So we, we've now introduced a term we should define it. Uh, like inheritance, Go uh, composition also is designed to provide re uh, reuse of objects. Um, in this case, one object is declared by including other objects, not by inheriting from them, but by including them. Uh, composition lets the structure and methods in one class be pulled into another. And so rather than being pushed down for, like inheritance, uh, the objects themselves are pulled in to uh, the, the new objects. Uh, so to, to drive that point home, inheritance passes knowledge down, uh, composition pulls knowledge up. And we'll demonstrate an example here in Go. So here we have a type. Uh, normally they'd be on top of each other, but for illustrative purposes I've aligned them side by side. Uh, so on the left we have a type that, we've def that we're declaring here type person, which is a struct, and it has a, a field called name, which is a string. And then on the next line, we've just put a type here. We haven't provided a field name. We've just put the type, and it's address. Um, and then on the right side, we've defined address and what that type is. Uh, to keep things clear, we're going to refer to address uh, or anything that we've embedded in this way as the inner type. Uh, so we can declare a method. So we're going to declare a method address uh, on, right, uh, on, we're going to declare a method string on address. Uh, string will give us a string value of this. Um, as an aside, if you're using any of the uh, formatting tools like print line, it'll automatically call string method if it's available to it, uh, which is just an, a neat feature of the format tools. Uh, 
So in this case, we're just concatenating the lines together and, and printing it out. So you notice we define that not on the outer type person, but on the inner type address. So now we're going to declare a new person. Uh, and inside of that, as part of the declaration, we're also going to declare a new address. Uh, you also pay attention that on the line that's bolded, where it refers to address, even though when we defined it, uh, we did not uh, give it a field name. We only gave it a type. Uh, the what automatically happens here is that it, when you only provide a field name, the the type itself, the only part of the type, the type itself becomes the field name. So here we're we're declaring a new person and declaring a new address as part of that. And then in action, we're going to take this uh, person that we've created, and we're going to call the string method on person. Now, at any, at any time here, we've not actually declared the method um, string on person. We've only declared it on address, but, but Go will enable us uh, through the composition that it provides. Uh, the, it'll, it'll look in the uh, inner type uh, if any method satisfies it and call that. Um, so it does this through something called promotion. Uh, what promotion does is it looks to see if a single inner type can satisfy the request, and then it promotes it. Uh, and this happens, it's through the dot operator that this happens. Uh, so the dot operator is used uh, to access both uh, fields and methods, so both of them can be promoted. Uh, because it's done through the dot operator, promotion only occurs during usage, not declaration. So you notice when we declared it, we actually declared uh, the person, and then we had to create as another composite literal inside of that to create the address. Uh, so during creation, we had to declare each of them. Uh, but during um, access or usage, uh, promotion comes into play. And promoted methods are considered for interface adherence. And I think that's one of the most powerful features of promotion. Does anyone have any questions to this point? This is the pretty much the media stuff we've got. So you should have some questions. Or you guys all might know this, but I, I, I learned a lot when I put this together. So I imagine some of this might be new to some people. Are people just shy in Miami? Yeah, I, I heard mumbles, but Bill, if you could just repeat what the question was. Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Uh, yes, the, we call them inner and outer just to keep them straightforward during the presentation. Uh, but you can embed you can embed anything. It doesn't have to be a struct. You can embed any type inside of any other type, as many levels deep as you'd like. Yes. Promotion will will continue through. That's a great question. No one's asked that question when I gave this presentation before. I've given it a, a few times. Uh, that's a great question. Compile error. Yeah, there is no ambiguity here. It only works when it's explicit. So I th I mean. Inheritance, multiple inheritance, often has a lot of ambiguities with it. Um, and, and promotion, you know, whenever you're bringing something in that's not explicitly there, it does bring some ambiguity. I like that Go doesn't let you get yourself into trouble. Uh, that it, if two things satisfy, it just, it just throws up. It says, no, 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 you have to be much clearer than that.
walk with you and for these guys to give up. It's really slow and lame. It doesn't seem like it. If you guys could get around that, is that why it's designed that way? Or is that just the language or both? So um, I'll speak to that the best I can. Uh, I, I haven't uh, written the internals myself, nor have I spent a lot of time with it. Uh, fundamentally, promotion is a cleaner way of doing things. Um, it is it is quick. Again, it happens on usage. It, it, it is definitely efficient. It's a very efficient operation. Um, I know from you know dynamic languages, I've done Ruby and Perl and PHP and Python and JavaScript. Uh, this this can be an expensive thing. It is not an expensive thing. Okay, that that's actually answers my question perfectly. That's what I need to know because you're right. In usually in in languages that have multiple inheritance, especially dynamic languages, the lookup sometimes happens at runtime, which is really expensive, and then it caches it. Okay. Yeah, and in this case, it it, it I'm pretty. I know it happens at compile time because that's where you get errors when there's issues right. of looking it up. Okay. So. It, and yeah, so it's very quick and it's extremely quick on run. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, we got another question. Oh, sir. So if you can't have multiple methods in these embedded types, presumably there's no concept of overriding. We're about to. Let me go to my next slide. All right, well, Wait, before you go to your next slide. Let me back up. Before you go to your next slide. One more question: Can address be a pointer? Uh, um, say it one more time. Yeah, can embedded type be a pointer? He's asking if you can embed a type, but as a pointer type, not just as a value type. I, I'm not sure. I think, I, I want to s say yes, Steve. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna say Bill would, Bill would probably know better than I would on that one. Uh, uh, with the embedded interfaces, the, the promotion, if you have multiple embedded types, uh, is it the outer type that gets the, that implements the, inter like if you have the inner type, let's, the string, the outer type. Let's talk about outer types now. Yeah, let's go a couple more slides ahead, and then we can have more questions. These are great questions. I was hoping to have a good discussion. So right. you, guys, you guys were shy at first. All you needed was a little, a little prodding. Um, so, so. Uh, this one thing I want to be clear about this, this is not overloading. Uh, so in a lot of languages, uh, Java, C++, C++, C Sharp, uh, overloading is the way we do this. Um, in this case, it, it's not overloading, and, and this is an example why. So originally, I just copied the same function from earlier at the top of the slide. So that's not new. Sorry, the same method from earlier at the top of the slide. Um, and at the bottom here, what we're doing is we're actually defining the string method on person. So it's on the outer type. And if you look internally uh, in, the, in the inner working of that method, we're going to return p.name uh, plus p.address.string. All right, so even though um, promotion enables us to say p.string and it just works, it also... Uh, it, it only does that because it can satisfy it through an inner type. Inner types are always accessible. Uh, so in this case, we're just going to access it right through. Uh, and again, if we don't provide a field name, the embedded type is itself. Uh, the, the name of the type is itself the, the accessor. So in this case, p.address.string. Um, and so to, to demonstrate this even further, um, when we, so we have the, the top is the exact same thing we had before, and I'm going to demonstrate now uh, in the next, the next two lines that we can call p.string. When we call p.string, because we've now defined that method, it'll call it on the person method. Uh, but even though that's the case, we still can, uh, can access the inner type method by just using the accessor as you would normally do. Steve, I lost your mic again. Oh, I'm, I'm not moving. I'm, I'm sitting in the same position. The mic isn't changing, but maybe I'll try and speak louder. You're good again now. It's probably Google, some weird 
web interference. Um, okay, so do I need to repeat what I said on this on this slide, or are we good? Well, somebody has a question. Hold on. So you got string on two embedded types, and you didn't get a compile error. I did not call string on two embedded types. Okay. I called string on the outer type, and I called string on the inner type. The outer. Runs down the chain. Okay. If you don't have it on the outer, but you have it on two inners. If you have it on two inners, it's ambiguous, so that's the compiler. Nice. Right. Okay. Correct. Oh, I got yeah, a question. So I got to go this way. We're making you work tonight, Bill. I'm just glad we can make it all happen. We need a drone. We need a microphone. Ah. Whoa. From your experience, you have some kind of uh, guidelines because I I found myself I've seen myself struggling between using an embedded type or just creating a a type a, you know a type alias a new type declaration and in one time we have if I do the type alias so I will lose the entire method set of the previous you know the original type but if I if I do embedding and then I will change how the the type is created. So you know, so if people get used to create an object X in a some way, and then I create a Y and embed it inside. So yeah, you get the functionality, but the way you create the this new Y object is not the same way that you create the X one. Of course, you can create a make function, but I'm just asking, if you have you have found yourself some kind of preference, like when to use type alias and when to use embedding. Uh, that's a good question. I honestly, I'd have to think through it. Um, I gen, you know, I generally um, don't use embedding. I, I, I generally don't use embedding. Um, I think a lot of the time it's clear to to define it in there. When do I use embedding? And the answer is when there's a benefit to doing so. Um, and and there's lots of reasons to do it. Uh, so, you know, one of the reasons I'll do it is because, and I'll talk about this in a few slides, uh, because I want to adhere to an interface, and the embedded um, type gives me that. Um, another one is uh, code reuse. So a lot of times, if I'm using, if it's the same structure in three different places. Um, you know, and I think address is a great example here. Um, I, I'll 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 embed that type. I think that makes a lot of sense uh, to do it. Um, so I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. One thing to remember is that Go has explicit types. So even if two types have the same structure, uh, they can't be used in place of each other. Right, and that's different from a lot of other languages. A lot of other languages uh, kind of have duck typing, uh, where if it if it looks the same, it, it would be the same. E even to the point where if I create a type um, called foo, which is a, a string, I can't pass that into a place that accepts a string because it's a, it's a distinctly different type. It's a type foo. Uh, so. So we, you, you know, that's one thing I think people need to be careful about with Go. Um, the type system is very explicit, and a lot of people say, "Well, how do you get around that?" Um, and and the answer is is interfaces, and we'll talk about that in in, in just a couple slides here. Uh, so I don't know if I gave you all the answers. I think, you know, and I don't know that I have all the answers, but from my experience, uh, I generally lean to defining things uh, first and then embed after. So I usually don't start embedding. I usually start writing it out uh, completely, but when I notice, I was like, wait, I've, I've done this before, um, and there's no reason not to just reuse that code, then, then I'll go to do embedding. 
All right, I hope that made sense. I'm going to move on to the next the next slide here. Um, so this is this is just what I was talking about here. The types remain distinct, um, and th this is a little more complex example than I gave. So in this case, we defined a function that takes uh, an address as a pointer to an address or a reference to an address, uh, an address pointer, um, and then we've defined our person just like we did earlier. That's the same. It's just compressed into. Uh, I took out the returns just to make it fit on the side. Um, and then we're going to try and pass person into this function that accepts an address. Um, and it won't work. It's going to say cannot use p type person as type address um, because they're distinct. So even though we do have promotion that'll promote methods and and fields, uh, it will not change the type. And this is something that's very different from inheritance. Um, so, big, big bold print. Promotion is not subtyping, right? And 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 that's we just demonstrated that. Um, so the other thing we want to talk about is polymorphism. So the first thing we talked about that defines object oriented is inheritance. The second thing is polymorphism. Uh, polymorphism definition is defined as the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. And it's typically implemented via generics, overlaid loading, or subtyping. All right, so what's Go's approach? Uh, well, we, we demonstrated uh, just now how Go explicitly avoided subtyping and overloading. Uh, and Go does not provide generics yet. I say it that way because in 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 dialogues with the core Go team, uh, specifically Rob Robert Griesmeyer and Robert Pike, they both said that it's not something that they think is a a, a bad idea. Um, it's just something that they didn't feel was necessary uh, when they were shipping Go 1.0. Right. So the way they built. Uh, the two of them and Ken Thompson, the, the first rule they had when they were building Go was, it, and this is different from any other language I've heard of in, de, in design, their, their first rule was, we're not going to include a feature unless all three of us agree that it's an essential feature to the language. And so a ton of things, uh, a ton of features fell on the cutting room floor because the three of them didn't agree it was essential to the language. Um, and so what you end up having is a very uh, elegant and pure language. Um, and, and so generics might come in at, in at some point, uh, but they didn't feel it was an essential feature to the language for their 1.0 release. Um, but Go does solve this problem uh, through what's called poly... Uh, it does provide some polymorphic capabilities. It's, it's not polymorphism in the traditional way, but it does solve a lot of the same uh, problems or that, that polymorphism is designed to solve. Um, and that's through, it does it through interfaces. So what is an interface in Go? Uh, an interface in Go is just a list of required methods. Uh, that, that's all it is. Um, it goes approaches to use structural, structural versus nominal typing. Uh, and what that means is rather than declaring things as adhering to an interface using uh, implements, keyword, or, or some other mechanism like that, what Go does is it says if it, if it satisfies it, if it has the methods the interface requires, then it, it adheres to it. Uh, and the terminology they use is, uh, the, to describe this is if something can do this, then it can be used here. And the convention is to call something a somethinger. So the string interface I was talking about earlier is, is actually defined as a stringer. Uh, so let's let's see some of this in action. So we're going to declare our, our interface here. In this case, it's a shaper. So our definition of a shaper is, is that it has an area method that returns an int. Um, here we're going to de uh, define a function that uh, accepts a shaper, and when you do that, it it will it will work as long as uh, it can access any of the methods 
that are defined by the interface, regardless of the underlying type. Um, it, so it can't access methods that weren't de defined in that interface. So in our case, we've already defined two different shapes, um, both of which adhere to Shaper. And in this case, we could pass either min here, and I'm about to demonstrate that. So here we have, we've created two rectangles and a, and a rex, which is that slice of rectangles. And then we're going to call describe on each of them. Now notice these are, we're having two different types here. Describe doesn't care. As long as they have the area method, uh, describe is happy. Uh, so James Gosling, the creator of Java, said, uh, he said, if it, a question was posed to him, if you could do Java all over again, what would you change? His response was, I'd leave out classes. Uh, the, the room he was in laughed uh, to that, but his, then he went on to explain that it, the, the real problem wasn't classes per se, but rather the implementation inheritance, the extends relationship. Interface inheritance, the implements relationship, is preferable. You should avoid implementation inheritance wherever possible. Um, so Go's interfaces are based on implementation, not declaration. Uh, so, so you know, following the wisdom, the, the lessons learned from Java, goes to gone in a different direction, and, and and the consequence of that, or the result of that, is that code is a lot simpler. It's a lot easier to read. It's also a lot easier to compile. Um, so let's demonstrate a little of the power of interfaces. So these are going to be a little more uh, in-depth examples. Uh, the first one here, we, we, uh, we're, we're here declaring a, a, an interface called reader. Um, we're not doing it. This is from the standard, uh, standard library. So this is called io.reader. Um, and I've just put it out here. So what IO reader definition is, is, is that it has a read method that accepts a byte, a slice of bytes, a byte slice, and responds with an integer and an error. Um, so it's so as we said, it's an interface. It's part of the standard library. The intent is that read will read up to length p bytes into p. Uh, so the entire entire set of p, uh, and it returns the number of bytes read and any error. Uh, the interface here does not dictate how read is implemented. It, it, it really doesn't care, uh, as long as it can call read and get the re results that it's looking for. Uh, and this is used throughout the entire standard library. So it's used in the op operating system file, uh, bytes buffer, net connection, uh, HTTP request, uh, and, and loads more places. And there's a lot of power that comes from that. So, so let's uh, we're going to talk about its counterpart, writer, and then I'm going to show you an example. So uh, the the inverse of writing, or reading is writing. You notice that uh, the the definition of the writer interface looks very similar to the reader interface, um, and and that's for good reason. Like like read, it instead of read, it will write up to length p bytes into p. Uh, it returns the number of bytes written in any, any error. Again, it's not dictated how writes implemented, and it's also used throughout the entire standard library by most of the same packages uh, that, in fact, all almost all the same packages that use Reader. So let's look at this in action. So what we're building here, and I want to underscore, those packages are very different. Uh, writing... Uh, writing to a file system is very different from writing to a HTTP request. Um, but they all implement the same interface and that lets you do some really neat things. So, so this is an example here. Uh, so we've defined a function called Marshall gzipped JSON. Uh, it accepts an IO reader uh, and an interface. And this is an interesting thing in Go. This is an empty interface. So here we've declared an interface We've declared V uh, as an interface without any requirements to it, uh, right? So it doesn't have any methods defined on this interface, which means everything satisfies it because it has no requirements. Uh, and so what we're doing here is the first thing we do is we use the gzip package and we create a new reader 
uh, and we pass in the IO reader that we get uh, as our parameter. It returns us back uh, an error and raw. We'll check the error to make sure that, that it's, it's nil. Uh, if it's not nil, we're going to return it. Um, and then we're going to take that the raw that comes in and we're going to pass it into a JSON decoder. So what's happening here is we've got a gzip JSON file and we've created a single method that's going to be able to unzip it, ungzip it, um, and decode it into our V. Right? In this case, V could is likely a, a map. And so it's going to populate the map with the values from the gzip JSON file. And this happens all transparently. It's also going to pipeline it uh, directly through. So it's not making copies of it because of the way the readers work. Um, all right, so continue with this. This is it in action. So here what we're going to do is we're going to open. We're going to call os.open um, and uh, presumably some J JSON gzip file on disk. It's going to give us f, which is a file handler. Um, F also adheres to the reader interface. We're going to again check the error. Uh, we're going to also call defer F close. What defer will do is it'll make sure that F dot close runs at the end of this function, even if it uh, even if it has an error. Um, we're going to create a map here. So we're going to make a map of string to interface, and then we're going to call our method with the file handle and it will populate our map M with all the values inside of that uh, JSON file. So what this is is practical interoperability. Um, so gzip new reader takes an IO reader. This works across a lot of different things, really anything you can create. There's nothing special needed in gzip to be able to do this. It simply calls read. So the gzip uh, new reader can work on anything. It can work on a byte buffer. It can work on a network connection. It can work on an HTTP request. It can work on a file. Right? It doesn't care. It just leaves. It, it um, delegates the responsibility of reading up to those packages to implement how they read. Care as long as it can call read and get back uh, the results, the bytes that it wants. It's it's going to be happy. Can you guys still hear me? I just got disconnected on my phone. Yeah, yes. Yeah, we hear you. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep going. I can no longer see the room because my entire screen is what you see. Uh, so it just be my eyes. Um, but we only have a, a few slides left. So in this case, we're going to pipe, and it's just a building on what we just talked about. We're going to pipe an HTTP response directly to a file. Uh, 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 so we're creating a, all of our functions in in our main uh, are called main. Uh, the main the one that runs when we run the executable is called main. Um, so we're going to call HTTP get and we're going to give it some URL. Um, it's going to give us a response and an error. We always check the error. Uh, we're going to defer closing the response. Uh, we're also going to create a called OS create which is going to create um, open a file handle to a file uh, on our local system um, so we've got HTTP get grabbing something from remote system we've got OS create uh, creating something on our local system uh, we've checked the errors and deferred the close of both of those and then on the last line and this is where the magic happens it's going to call IO copy and what IO copy is going to do is it's going to copy uh, the second parameter, uh, which is a reader, into the first parameter, which is a writer. So it's going to stream those bytes directly from one source into the next. Uh, and, and you could do this with lots of different things. Uh, in this case, it, it's from a web, uh, you know, from a remote file on a web server to a local file. Uh, I think this is super powerful. Um, and you know, I've th I think of how I do this in a lot of other languages. None of them would be this elegant, and none of them would be nearly this efficient. Um, like this is just really, really well done. And this, this, this here speaks to the power 
of, of interfaces. Um, so go. Uh, so Steve Jobs said, simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. And I think that really applies to Go. Um, so Go is simple, practical, and wonderful. Uh, so now Go build something great. And, and that's my I Go. One more thing. Thank you. Have any questions for Steve? Hey, Steve, thank you very much. That was that was awesome. You're, you're very welcome. All right. So yeah, we had, we had a good discussion in the middle. I'd I'd love to have, to answer any other questions people have. Questions? I think uh, I think they got it. Yeah. You know, when you don't get questions, that means you did a really good job or a really bad job. <laughs> And speaking to your audience. Luckily, I got a lot of questions when we were introducing kind of the meat in the middle. So I probably did a, a pretty decent job. Yeah. Uh, there are thoughtful questions. All right. I'm going to stop the broadcast. So you should still be on.